Hey there, everyone. Today on the Final Bar, happy Monday. We'll talk about the S&P 500 testing 4,500 from below. Not quite getting there. Energy stocks lagging behind today. A bit of a different feel to the tape. Tesla upgraded by Morgan Stanley. What do the charts say about another 50% upside, which is where this stock was upgraded to from uh, Morgan Stanley? Finally, we'll open the Final Bar mailbag. Which scans can help you identify ideas when the market is in pullback mode? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Final Bar. Hey everyone, welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a rainy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the action in the markets using the best practices of technical analysis. We're in the meat of the seasonally weakest month of the year, or certainly one of them, but this period of the year, sort of August into September, Usually pretty rocky for stocks, especially in a pre-election year like 2023. So what does that mean? I think that overall tells you about the underlying conditions, right? What is the overall trend, the general cycle, the feel to this part of the calendar year? But at the end of the day, the cycles tell you what could happen or what's likely to happen. At the end of the day, it's all about focusing on the weight of the evidence. And I think that's the essence of a good disciplined approach using technical analysis. Don't think about what should happen or what could happen Focus on what is happening. We're continuing to see strength in certain areas of the market. Tesla gapping higher today on an analyst uh, upgrade. But other names like Alphabet, Amazon, hanging in there just fine. If you didn't know that the market was in a bit of a pull mark, cor a pullback correction type of mode, you wouldn't know by looking at the chart of uh, Amazon. Other st sectors and stocks that have been doing quite well, like Marathon Oil and other energy companies, getting a bit of a distribution today, sort of uh, pushing lower while other things were up on average. So as always, a lot of moving parts. This week, quite a lot to talk about. We've got um, you know latest CPI data coming out on Wednesday. We have ARMS IPO, another AI play coming out. We'll see what the market anticipates and uh, plays after that. We also have some really good guests live in the studio this week, including the great Ralph Acampora. So a lot of really good stuff to prepare for you. Let's get to today's market recap. See what happened here on a Monday in the, uh, in the markets after the weekend and uh, try to make sense of things the best we can. Before we get there, quick poll question. We asked you recently, which price pattern features stable highs and higher lows? And that's important to think about that, right? The highs are stable, meaning it's sort of a consistent level, higher lows. That is indeed an ascending triangle and points to our producer Skybox, who actually correctly answered that. So well done, Sky. Uh, we had a four different choices, and all these are different consolidation um, uh, signals, basically. These things, particularly the symmetrical triangle, ascending and uh, descending triangle, are a continuation pattern, meaning you have a rally, then this pattern emerges, and then you often continue in the same direction. And it's noted by the lows getting higher, so that upward sloping triangle sort of looks like it's setting up to break out. The trigger is when we finally break through that uh, resistance level. If you are unfamiliar with some of those price patterns, number one, go back to the classics. John Murphy's technical analysis of the financial markets. Edwards and McGee's technical analysis of stock trends. Well worth an investment in your, uh, in your uh, investing future for sure. But also go to our chart school. It's a free part of the stock charts platform. Shows you a great example of those patterns, how to analyze them, and how to interpret a breakout in either direction. Let's continue on with our market recap. See what happened in the markets today. Sort of a gap higher today, certainly a, a big push higher. We opened well above Friday's close around 44.90, chopped around for quite a bit, finished back toward the highs of the day. So overall, stocks having a decent update. The S&P 500 up 0.7%. Now that doesn't get us quite above 4,500. But that key level of resistance now once again in play. We talked about sort of drifting below that 4,500 level. Not that the end of the world or, you know, it's the, it's the next best thing when we cross a, you know, one particular price level like 4,500. But for me, taking a step back, defining some key levels, what we call a pivot point, right? A level that has meaning and just recognizing whether we're above or below that level as a basic test of whether we're okay, whether we're recovering, or whether we're still in a correction. I think that can be really helpful. It's a simple way of just making sense of all the noise in the market. So for now, the s and still below that 4,500 level. We start getting above 4,500, you immediately think of 4,600, think of 4,800. Those would be the, uh, the all-time highs and maybe something beyond there. But first things first, we have to get above 4,500. That's the level to watch this week. The NASDAQ composite, nice update as well, 1.1% higher, still below 14,000. So that would be sort of that line in the sand to watch 
uh, for the NASDAQ. Mid caps and small caps basically flat for the day, just narrowly positive, uh, but not by much. The VIX pushing lower, and I was looking earlier at the move index, which is kind of like the VIX for the bond markets, and the VIX, which looks at the options market to imply a volatility for uh, basically the equity markets for the S&P 500. We're at pretty low levels, not all time lows, but pretty low relative to the last couple of years for sure. And that low volatility environment basically tells you there's not a lot of uncertainty as measured by the VIX. There's not a lot of fear, if you call that the fear gauge, pretty low. The reason I think that tells you two things. Number one, good to know that that is sort of the sentiment behind the market conditions right now, but also recognize if and when the VIX starts to spike higher. It will happen at some point, not today, but at some point recognizing that spike higher in the VIX uh, is, uh, is pretty, uh, pretty meaningful, can be a, a very helpful uh, market indication. Looking at interest rates, we have 10-year yields, five-year, 30-year points, all drifting higher, not by much, though. So the 10-year yield just below 4.3%. Long bond yield around 438, five-year point around 441. So overall, again, we have relatively high interest rates over time, over the last uh, year and a half or so. Uh, and that trend in higher rates, ideally, or not ideally, but normally, will be putting a lot of pressure on growth stocks. Uh, as a tease to the mailbag uh, we're going we're gonna to be getting into, one of the questions has to deal with that value versus growth relative performance in the face of rising rates. So we'll look at some evidence and answer that question together. Bond prices, of course, coming down a little bit. The TLT was down 0.7%. No doubt, I think, from a classic technical approach, the TLT, the AG, uh, LQD, which is a um, uh, uh, corporate bond ETF, all of those basically in a pretty consistent uh, downtrend. The dollar index down about a half a percent uh, using the uh, UUP, a bullish dollar ETF. A lot of green on the commodities page. The DBC, which is a broader commodity ETF, up 0.6%. Gold slightly higher, about 0.2% higher to around 178.40. And the SLV, a silver ETF, up 0.7%. Copper price is moving higher, which is not something we've seen uh, consistently in quite some time. Note how crude oil, natural gas prices essentially flat. Energy got hit pretty good today looking at the stocks, uh, but the uh, crude oil ETFs, uh, not too much to the upside, basically flat for the day. A lot of red looking at Bitcoin. I think it's an interesting week to pay attention to cryptocurrencies. Always is, of course, but you know we have a lot of, uh, we have inflation data coming up on Wednesday, the CPI number. Um, you know, a new AI name coming out called ARM, the IPOing later this week. All of those things certainly could impact risk assets. I think it's very interesting to see how something like Bitcoin and Ethereum, how they trade relative to stocks and other risk assets leading into those announcements, how they perform going after. Do you see people, uh, investors, taking on additional risk in the form of cryptocurrencies? In general, I I've tended to think of cryptocurrencies as risk assets. It tends to be a proxy for speculation. It's not like Investors go risk off and they go to Bitcoin as a safe haven. It's really more of a way of expressing uh, optimism or pes pessimism overall. So it will be interesting to see uh, with the stronger dollar that we've seen with additional economic data coming through the course of the week, what happens to cryptocurrencies for today, all in the red. Now, Bitcoin's still above that 25,000 level. We talk about lines in the sand. That's a pretty clear level on the chart of Bitcoin. We'll get to that chart uh, and all of those if we can here in a, in a moment. Looking at sectors here very quickly, XLY at the top of the list. I mentioned an upgrade for Tesla. Uh, an analyst of Morgan Stanley uh, put a pretty aggressive price target uh, up to uh, around 400 for that stock. It's currently you know, implying a much bigger uh, gain than we've seen thus far and certainly a broad recovery. Tesla, one of the biggest weights in the XLY. So that ETF is up 2.7% today. Communication services up 1.5%. Then consumer staples, number three, a 0.8%, sort of a, a head scratcher of sorts to see a fairly defensive sector right, uh, right up on uh, number three. At the bottom of the list, as I mentioned, energy kind of down while everything else was flat to positive today. The XLE was down one and a quarter percent. Industrials, real estate basically flat from Friday's close. Let's go to a daily chart of the uh, S&P 500 next. Um, I took those, those arrows away. I was going through these charts uh, over the weekend and publishing my weekly flight plan for my market misbehavior premium members. And I was I was linking it just again, I'm, I'm a big fan of behavioral finance and just mindset and how we approach things. I found that those arrows on my chart were just really locking me in mentally to this idea of the ABC correction and this fact that we're in this three wave pattern that's going to perfectly go down around 4250 and it's all going to make great you know sense in the uh, in life when we look back years from now. I, I'm trying to unplug a little bit from that, uh, my own narrative bias, if, uh, if any. 
Uh, so I took those lines off, but again, I think the base case that makes sense here is we had that initial drop. We broke through a number of trend lines. We broke through the 50-day moving average. We broke back above there going into the Labor Day weekend and then came back down. So we're literally chopping around the 50-day moving average. On Friday, we closed below it around 44.50. Today, we closed back above the 50-day moving average. So again, sort of a, an open question as to whether we're able to continue to push higher and get back to 4,600. You know, for now, I think above or below the 50-day moving average is a good starting point to the analysis. And we'll look at some other names in a little bit. I think some of the stocks, some of the leading growth names that have not broken their 50-day moving average, I think that tells you a lot about the consistency and really the persistence of that, uh, of that uptrend uh, over time. If we would break lower through the course of this week, and as you look forward to you know, Wednesday into Thursday, and we have our latest uh, CPI number, you have to remember this is one of those times where good news is bad, bad news is good. And what I mean is if you have an inflation number that comes out better than expected, meaning the economy is doing well, you would normally intuitively think that's probably good for stocks because the economy is doing well. But you have to remember we are now playing a, we're having a, an extended dance party with the Fed. And the better economic data looks today or the better that inflation data will look, the more likely that the Fed can be more aggressive, a more hawkish Fed raises uh, rates higher. That creates more of a headwind to growth stocks and our growth-oriented equity uh, benchmarks. And so good news would probably be bad for stocks. Bad news, meaning inflation coming down, economy slowing down. That bad news actually implies that the action the Fed has taken to date and their implications of the future uh, activities they're going to uh, going to do actually are, are, are working and, and inflation is coming to a reasonable level. So keep that in mind as we get to uh, Wednesday's data. Certainly could be a big move uh, for, uh, for sure either way. Worth noting the RSI is almost dead even, meaning up days and down days pretty consistent. You've got a little up, a little down. At the end of the day, the S&P 500 is about at the midpoint between 4,600 on the upper end and 4,350 on the lower end. We're around 4,487 today at the close. That's almost exactly in the middle between those two extremes. So we're kind of in a narrowing of the range, if that uh, phrase makes sense to you. Now, we've talked about breadth indicators. I don't want to beat that uh, too much further, but you know, as a reminder, looking at the percent of stocks remaining above their 50-day or not can be really helpful. Think about how the S&P today closing back above its 50-day moving average. About one in three S&P stocks can say the same, which means two out of every three S&P stocks are still below their 50-day moving average. If you're bullish here, if you think the short-term low is in, if you think August was the end of the pullback, and you think it's lights out new highs from this point, you probably want to assume that this uh, percent of stocks above their 50-day continues to actually go higher, actually starts to go higher. It's still pretty low relative to where we've been for the last three months or so. You really need to see that uptick, which would mean a lot of individual stocks are breaking above their own 50-day moving average. That additional upswing is what causes the benchmarks to uh, gain in value. It's also worth noting we're right at 52%, we'll call it, of S&P stocks above their 200-day. As long as this holds 50%, Things just aren't getting that bad as measuring by, measured by this broad measure of market breadth. We start breaking below that uh, by the end of this week, and I would be concerned about further downside, not just for the S&P, but broadly speaking, uh, equities as well. Now, one of the charts, I think, that helps tell the story of relative uh, strength and weakness is this one that I, I call offense versus defense. I just want to point out an interesting anomaly that's just happened uh, today. So if you look at it, this is the cap-weighted version, the XLY over the XLP. And as we mentioned many times, this is simply looking at offense, things you want, versus uh, defense, things you need, right? You always need toilet paper and beverages and cleaning products and household goods. So those staples you're probably gonna spend money on no matter what the environment. Discretionary purchases like travel and hotels and new cars and new clothes and new watches uh, are all discretionary. You don't necessarily need to upgrade them, but it's nice to, nice to do it when you're, uh, when you're able. So the fact that this ratio keeps going higher on the surface I think tells a pretty constructive story that things you want are doing just fine, meaning consumers are spending, or the expectation is that consumers will continue to spend on those purchases. But look at what's happened in the last week. In September, you're seeing a new swing high here, but on the equal weighted version at the bottom, this ratio is actually ticking lower. The reason is because Tesla is a big weight in the numerator of this ratio, and these are cap-weighted uh, ETFs. So 
Tesla being a huge weight up 10 plus percent today is going to cause this ratio to just jump higher. The equal weighted version where Tesla is just as important in any, any, as important as any other restaurant or other, other random hotel name uh, in, the, uh, in the consumer discretionary sector, that ratio is actually sloping downward. So a bit of a mixed signal here so far in September. I like to watch both of those because it tells you a little bit about overall strength and weakness, but also leadership, whether it's the leading names or some of the smaller names that are getting it done. I would watch this certainly through the course of this week as some of the uh, you know mega cap growth names are still holding up just fine. Again, Tesla, a good example of that uh, today. And I want to mention just quickly to round off our market recap, a couple charts that came up in my morning coffee routine as I was going through uh, charts preparing for the show. Semiconductors for now appearing to put in a lower high. The SMH, which is a broad semiconductor ETF, flat for the day today. So while the S&P was up about 1%, uh, the uh, SMH actually flat uh, from, uh, from Friday's close. And what's interesting is this is still below its 50-day moving average. We put in a pretty clear lower high about a week ago. This is right around the uh, Labor Day holiday. So the high was here around 160. We put in a lower high around 157. Could be setting up as a pretty clear topping pattern, right? Sort of this head and shoulders topping pattern. Now, to really complete that pattern, you have to break below the neckline. The neckline's actually way down here around 140, 142. So you have a long way to go here. It's not that long. It's eight points away. But you still have to go further down to actually complete that uh, head and shoulders top. But a lower high is enough for me to think that uh, there's uh, some potential cause for concern there. Let's look at Tesla. As I mentioned, an upgrade today. The stock's up about 10%. Uh, after the close, uh, an analyst at Morgan Stanley uh, put a pretty high uh, target. This is based on the, I think it's called the Dojo Supercomputer, one of the biggest supercomputers in the world, helping uh, the uh, um, automated driving uh, that's built into a lot of Tesla models. Uh, and uh, the implications of that are pretty, uh, pretty astronomical, as evidenced by that price target. What's interesting is from a technical perspective, that price target of 400 basically puts us back to the high from the fourth quarter of 2021. So what that analyst is saying is basically we have upside back to the previous highs. Now, what I will always tell you on a chart like this is before you can have a 50% gain, you have to have a 5% gain. Now, with equities, there is certainly an opportunity that a stock could gap up quite a bit or gap down quite a bit. Usually around earnings, you'll get those sort of significant gaps. Today, just on the news flow, on the analyst upgrade, you had a gap higher. And again, what's interesting is we opened higher, pushed higher through the course of the day. And that's often something I'll watch on these gap days to see what happens during the day. More buyers, additional buyers seem to be coming in to push that price even higher. I'd be watching that 300 level like a hawk. That's where I have an alert set. I would encourage you to go to our alert manager, go to charts and tools, go to your alerts and set one for if and when Tesla gets above 300. It's probably more when than if, but uh, the, the when is a, is a real question mark. It gets above there from a technical perspective. You're basically eclipsing the July high, which lines up very well with the highs from August and September of last year. We get above there. Not a lot from a technical perspective uh, between here and those levels that were quoted. So upside there could certainly happen. I would be looking to see if we can get above 300 first. Also watch the momentum starting to improve the R side getting just above 60 today. I'm also uh, you know, in, in inspired a little bit when I'm looking at charts like Alphabet or I'm looking at charts like Amazon. As much as we're talking about an ABC correction, as much as we're talking about you know, what levels to think about uh, for further downside for the S&P, look at how something like Amazon is just a textbook uptrend, right? Higher highs, higher lows, finding support at an ascending 50-day moving average. The RSI is bullish. It's constructive but not excessive. The relative strength is improving. Charts like this are telling you things are fine. And what's interesting is not all charts look like the chart of Amazon. We talked about how others like semiconductors, like energy maybe, putting a bit of a uh, concerning bearish divergence or a uh, bearish uh, engulfing pattern today. At the end of the day, great opportunity as always to stick with what's working. As I've mentioned before, it's always a good time to own good charts. We're going to continue on the show here in a minute with our final bar mailbag. We have some really good questions to, uh, to go through with you. Before we get there, a couple quick announcements. First off, we welcome your questions. We'd love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag. I think we'll do a mailbag uh, show on Friday of this week. So we'd love to hear from you. You can email us your questions at thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. As a reminder, putting a little permalink with the chart you're looking at can be super helpful. So on Sharp Charts or on ACP, make sure you share the chart. You'll have a little hyperlink you can include right in your question. On X, just tag us in a comment at Final Bar SCTV. On our YouTube channel, of course, just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. We would love to hear from you and hope to answer your question 
in our next Mailbag Show on Friday. We had a great live Q&A last Wednesday, and we're doing it every Wednesday for now at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. I go to our podcast studio, which is right around the corner to our main uh, Stock Charts TV studio. I have a great setup there. We'll bring up a couple initial charts, and then it's all driven by your questions. And if you've been to one of them before, it can be a wide-ranging discussion touching on a lot of different topics, but it will definitely be a lot of fun. So make sure you set a reminder for Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern. If you go to our YouTube channel now, go to the little live button. You can set a reminder and notification so you don't miss it. Also, just one final comment, 9-11, a very difficult day for uh, me and others, of course, uh, as we uh, remember that uh, difficult date in our nation's history. We have a great link in our description below. An interview we did a couple years ago with Jay Woods, he talked about how incredible it was to be on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange when it reopened for the first time after 9-11. So as you remember today, I hope you can click on that link and watch those comments from Jay Woods. Let's continue on opening the final bar mailbag and see what sort of questions we've got from, uh, from all of you. And again, thanks so much for sending in some thoughtful questions. Here's number one. With rates around October 2022 levels, why has value not performed better versus growth? What the heck? And I agree with you. I, I have a real what the heck kind of moment when I'm looking at this uh, particular chart that you asked about. And, and I will tell you, um, this is something that me and many others in the industry have been talking about. And if you've caught some of the conversations I've had with uh, my guests, we've addressed this particular issue. Um, this is the chart, I think, that tells that relationship pretty well. Uh, here's dollar sign TNX, which is the 10-year uh, Treasury yield. Again, this is an index quoted from the CBOE. So when it says 42.88, that actually means 4.288% as the yield on the 10-year uh, Treasury. And we have other uh, indexes that track the other maturity points all coming from, uh, from the exchange. Um, so right now, as you can see over the last six months, rates have been trending higher. And if you've tried to buy a house or any other thing where you've tried to borrow money, you probably have seen how much your rate has probably gone up. Uh, if you tried it a couple years ago, it's a totally different conversation and a different level of commitment in terms of the interest payments you're probably uh, now responsible for. So that trend higher in rates usually is really bad for growth stocks because they don't tend to do well when rates are going higher. And it has all to do with growth stocks, right? A value stock is more something that is a more mature company. Generally speaking, um, it tends to uh, pay more out in terms of dividends than in capital appreciation because it's already kind of been, it's already done that big explosive growth. Now it's more of a mature company that's just churning out value for the, uh, for the shareholders. Um, the problem with growth stocks is that they do less of that. And it's more about the prospects of future growth. And when you're, dollar, you're dollarizing or, or uh, monetizing what those future earnings are worth today, higher rates basically mean the future earnings are worth less, right? And, and so that is the challenge of rising rates for growth stocks. Now, it is totally counterintuitive based on that, what I just told you, that the uh, value to growth ratio has been going down. Now, it made sense here probably in the first half of the year as uh, rates were coming down and as growth stocks were, under, were outperforming, which is what happens when this ratio goes lower. But as rates go back up, shouldn't value stocks be doing better? I would argue a big part of this is because it's not just in a vacuum, right? It's not just interest rates and growth stocks and what's the relationship and that's it. You have to remember there are a bunch of other things going on. So when you have an AI-fueled rally, when people are so desperate to get exposure to anything with AI, particularly semiconductors and other growth stocks, conglomerates like Microsoft and Apple and Alphabet, that can cause this ratio to look a little different than you might expect. So I always try to remind people, things like rising interest rates, I always describe them in the phrase phraseology of headwinds and tailwinds, which are aviation terms to just tell you things that are preventing your forward progress or things that are helping your forward progress. And I would think of it more along those lines. Higher rates are usually a tailwind for value stocks and usually a headwind for growth stocks. It has not been the case. Now, a couple things could happen eventually, which I think is probably the, the likely outcome is eventually that bid up that we saw from the sort of AI frenzy of earlier this year kind of settles down. Maybe the IPO this week uh, reinforces that or brings that into question, but I, th I think it'll certainly be a noteworthy uh, thing to watch. But after that, maybe we uh, see value stocks continue to do better. Maybe we see growth stocks, which have initially pulled back, have a bit of a further retracement. I thought we were going to see a little more of that as energy started to rotate higher, as technology, communication services names have rotated a little bit lower. We sort of chopped back, and now we're getting a bit, a bit of a mean reversion uh, over, the, uh, over the last week. But I think this chart is an important one to watch. And just remember, none of these things happen in a vacuum. We love to simplify. We love to say higher rates mean this for this type of stock. 
It's never a guarantee because there are so many other things happening at any given moment. Um, I've been taught two things. Don't fight the Fed and don't fight the tape. And there are times when those are the same thing or very similar. Sometimes they're actually a little bit different. I would argue, uh, you know, in some ways, I think those are giving you mixed signals uh, here in uh, September of 2023. Great question, by the way, and addressing that relationship. Here's question number two. Dave, why are GLD and dollar sign gold giving slightly different te technical indications? Aren't these based on the same thing? Uh, and so here's the thing, right? So just to set the, uh, the stage, the GLD, and I'm just using my charts for simplicity. You did send some links with your question. Thanks again for that. When you're looking at the GLD, this is an ETF uh, from the uh, sector spiders that holds physical gold. And that's one of the big, I think, selling points, certainly in, in terms of marketing, is that you are owning something that holds physical gold. And so you're getting direct exposure um, to, uh, to that asset. A lot of things will hold futures or will use derivatives or swaps or something to try to mimic the returns of an underlying asset. But I think it's always helpful to own an ETF that literally owns the physical commodity because that tells you you're getting a direct play on the assets that they hold. Um, so GLD is that ETF. Dollar sign gold is actually looking at the gold futures market, which is basically spot gold and showing you uh, how these things are related. Now, these charts are not too dissimilar. So you can see, for example, both of them are sort of bouncing off of the 200-day moving average. Both of them, as of this week, are at the 50-day. And I'm just quickly going back and forth uh, between the two. And both of them, on a relative basis, have been underperforming uh, the S&P 500. But if you zoom in a little bit, you'll see some subtle differences between the GLD and gold, particularly the GLD has made a clear lower low in August, while the uh, gold commodity, gold future, has not. So here's the thing. Those two are not tracking the exact same thing. It's close. And I would say two things that tend to impact any sort of commodity ETF. The one is the rollover effect, uh, and the other one would be um, premium and discount. And I'll explain both of those very quickly. Um, the rollover basically means when you have a commodity, um, you will have, a, and I'm just in terms of how you quote a continuous contract, where we see gold continuous contract, what that means is we are taking every month or quarter, depending on the future, how often they roll to a new contract, those contracts have an expiration, and then you have to roll to the new contract. There is no generally accepted practice in the market data industry, of which stock charts is, is certainly a part of financial technology, where we all agree on how to roll futures or how to connect and create a continuous contract. It's up to each provider to figure out a way we want to do it. So people will use different weightings. Some will just switch quickly from one contract to the next. Some will switch and then requote some of the previous prices to make it more of a continuous uh, series. But anytime you see a continuous contract on any provider, you're basically stringing together a bunch of previous gold futures every month or every quarter. So they could look different from charting platform to charting platform, and it could certainly affect things like support and resistance levels. There's no great way to change that, unfortunately, because you have to do something because you're literally looking at a different thing every month. The other problem that you run into, just in terms of why these might be a little different, is something like the GLD will often trade at a premium or a discount. I don't think it's a big problem with GLD, but certainly with um, you know, things like a Bitcoin trust or something, it's a little less liquid, a little less established, there can often be a dramatic premium, right? So the ETF may be trading at a 1% or 10% or 30% premium or discount to the underlying asset. There's the net asset value, how much that they actually own of whatever it is, and then the premium or discount because it's freely traded. So how much more or less are investors willing to pay for that net asset value? So those two things will cause some very subtle differences. It usually doesn't make a huge difference. So if you take a step back from your monitor, you see those two data series are similar, but they are gonna be different. And those are probably the two likely reasons, among others that are probably smaller and less meaningful, but those are the two big ones. The premium or discount, which any ETF that holds something else will often have some sort of thing. And it could be a little issue, like the SPY, it's minimal and it's minuscule because there are arbitrage uh, 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 firms that try to play that. And it's also the, uh, pre the premium discount, and it's also the, uh, the commodity. So anytime you're looking at commodity, there's a rollover effect that tends to uh, influence the data series over time. So great question, and uh, that would be the reason. Chart number three, during a pullback, what scan would you recommend using relative strength? I love this question so much uh, for a number of reasons. And I, and I will tell you this, I don't like to change my scans too much given the market environment. Um, and I will tell you, this is maybe a, um, 
uh, a, a, we may have different philosophical differences if you ask different people the same question. But for me, I like simple approaches that are repeatable and, and not just repeatable, but robust. And what robust means when you're talking about a quantitative model, some sort of statistical model, is how well does it deal with different uh, you know, cycles or different regimes. Meaning if it works today, how confident can you be it's gonna to work tomorrow when conditions are a little different or a year from now? And I like things that are relatively simple and relatively robust, meaning it's not hard to understand and it's probably gonna work not as, as perfectly as more of an optimized system, but it's gonna work more consistently. I'm, I'm a big fan of consistency and consistent routines and consistent outcomes uh, for sure. So for me, my scanning process doesn't change at all if we're in a bull phase or a bear phase. Now, it can change if there's a good opportunity, and I'll share with you a couple scans that I run uh, very quickly, just all the time that I think are really meaningful, and I'll, I'll explain to you why. The first one I would do are the main scans that I run, the new swing highs and new swing lows. I run these multiple times a week. These are actually the weekly scans that I run uh, for my Market Misbehavior Premium members. Midweek, we do a market update, and I base it off of the results of this scan. So which stocks are making a new high or a higher close than the last 13 weeks. And if you hit pause on the video, if you look here, basically recreate this exact syntax in our scanning engine, you'll see the same results that I, uh, I see as well. And basically this gives you the, uh, the syntax that explains today, uh, whenever I run it, we are closing higher than the last 13 weekly closes. And again, each of these uh, criteria could be, could be changed, obviously, uh, very simply. And then the opposite for new lows, right? Which ones are we undercutting the last 13 weekly closes? Now, I think that's a helpful group of stocks in any scenario, and I will tell you why it's helpful to use it now, is because when your new three-month highs uh, list gets smaller and smaller, and that's one of the first things that I, that I look at, a couple months ago, new highs were outnumbering new lows by 8 to 1, 10 to 1 ratios. Nothing was making a new 13-week uh, low, and a bunch of things were making a new 13-week high. All of a sudden, we get in this pullback phase, and the new highs are shrinking and the new lows are growing. So just seeing how many stocks come up and can fulfill that criteria can be helpful to tell you about the market conditions and how they're changing. Now, in terms of a particular scan that I like to run, uh, this is one that I would, uh, I would look for. This is one that says... Uh, I'm looking at ETFs in this example, but the general syntax uh, has two particular uh, uh, items. So these are just defining my universe as saying ETFs with no inverse or leveraged ETFs. I'm doing a very simple um, you know, volume requirement to make sure it's liquid enough for me. And then I have two particular items I'm looking for. A scooter ranking over 90, which means it's in the top decile of ETFs or stocks, whatever I would define uh, this, uh, this scan for and the RSI is left less than 50. So think about what that is telling you. The scooter ranking being very high means compared to all of its peers, this gets you to your relative strength question, this is a stock or an ETF that's doing better than almost nine out of 10 of the other uh, things in its universe. So it's one of the better trends, and that's using medium term and long term as the main time frame. The RSI being below 50 means it's pulled back into a position of short-term weakness. So I would never just blindly buy something because it came up on the screen, but this usually gives me a working list of things to look for. So things that I would focus on, use the scooter rankings and say a scooter ranking over 80 or 90 or 70, whatever gives you a good working list, and then look for signals like the RSI being oversold or the RSI being below 40 or the MACD giving a buy signal, which would tell you not only is it pulling back, but it's actually starting to rotate higher. By using longer term relative strength indicators and shorter term tactical indicators, a lot of times you can find things that have been doing very well, but are pulling back in the short term. That's usually a good working list that I would uh, suggest you start with. So that's how I'd answer that question. Great one, by the way. Next one, would you label Alibaba, ticker B-A-B-A, -A, a symmetrical triangle pattern? Your, the short answer to your question is no. Um, here's the longer answer, and it goes back to, it's funny, this question came in, and I'm immediately uh, thinking of the, um, uh, the, the poll question that we asked. It was really more of a, a quiz on different uh, type of triangle patterns. You know, I, I, you know, is this a bit of a consolidation? 100% sure. And I think the, the, the general trend you were sort of thinking of was like this, right? If I take the you know, highs getting lower and the lows getting higher, I'm kind of drawing this quickly for, for time, you know, it looks like a symmetrical triangle, but this isn't a great fit to the data, right? So this should be more down to here. This should be more up to here. So I'm sort of gaming it a little bit. I see this, uh, just to get rid of those lines, I see this as more of a consolidation phase. Uh, and I'll tell you where I see it. I think we've settled into this range 
uh, right about here. And sorry for the unreadable color choice. There you go. So using a rectangle, anytime you can draw a rectangle around the price data and where it looks like it fits it pretty well, this is that third phase when I would consider, right? You have a distribution phase where we're going lower, an accumulation phase where we're going higher, and a consolidation phase where we're going sideways. I would argue that's the range we're in, and I think Alibaba looks really interesting with a break above 100 or even 105. I think it looks really bad with a break below 80. And in the middle, I would say we're range bound. When you have price and two flat moving averages right in the middle, that tells you an absence of momentum. That tells you there's no real uh, you know, side buyers or sellers taking control. I think that's a neutral chart at best. Look to see when we break out of that range. That's how I would describe this as more just a general consolidation phase, down 1.5% uh, today. And also there's a macro effect thinking about China and uh, non-U.S. stocks in general, the strength of the dollar, all of that I think fits into the performance of uh, Alibaba as well. Final question, and I thank you so much for asking this. I love the new technology previews. When will they be fully released? If we all had a crystal ball for stock picking and development cues, I think we'd be doing pretty well for ourselves. You would mentioned the uh, technology previews, and if you've not experimented with them, I would encourage you to. They are pretty well-functioning uh, previews. We've made little tweaks to them, maybe when you've not been noticing, because we're getting a lot of great feedback. We're you know, really getting it tested by a, lot of, a larger number of users, which is very helpful for our development team. So thank you so much for testing them, and hit our support desk with any feedback that you have on it. The new Sharp Charts workbench is a completely reworking of the user interface, all the stuff around the chart. The Sharp Charts 3.0 is redesigning the actual charting engine from scratch. One of our head developers started from zero code and has created this entire new charting platform for the first time in 24 years. It is a massive undertaking, but it is going to be so cool. All the things many of you have been asking for that we've been unable to really do, given the uh, legacy of our charting platform, will all hopefully go away. We'll be able to do some really cool things. And the redesigned market carpets are fabulous. These are demo versions with some initial data sets just to show you what it's going to look like. You have a lot of great choices in terms of color, in terms of what names you're looking at, and what time periods and what indicators and techniques you're looking at. For me, I am thrilled to use this day to day to get a sense of what's happening and also look at larger time frames as well. Short answer is we're looking here in the next month and a half or so. We're hoping in October we're able to do what's called our Edmonds release. All of our releases are based off of uh, geographical locations in the state of Washington, the general area of the uh, Pacific Northwest. The Edmonds release will be coming up uh, next year. We're looking at the fall and uh, hopefully we'll include all of these things or most of the stuff that you see in the technology previews. That will set the stage for the next one is an F at Friday Harbor, I believe, which is a really pretty area uh, around the Puget uh, Sound. That actually will be uh, uh, the next release probably around year end. And with that, we hope to build on our new charting engine, address a lot of the other things in the uh, development queue. By the way, you have the ability to influence our development. Check out those uh, technology previews and let us know what you think. But also uh, hit the little help uh, button in the upper right and send a note to our support desk. If there's a feature or a capability that Stock Charts does not have, particularly when you're having to go to another platform to use, let us know because we are actively building our platform. We want to make it better and uh, we would love to use your input along the way. We've got to wrap this show, folks. Great mailbag as always. We've got to go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. You know, as I talked many times about this pullback phase, this corrective phase that we're in, I'm reminded when I'm going through the charts this weekend, Amazon's up another 3.5% today, but I think the, the overall trend just has been very constructive. And whether or not you debate what should happen, I'm not a big fan of the macro thesis, right? Stocks are vulnerable, so you don't want to buy anything. I am a big fan of letting the chart tell you when you should change positions. So you can either make a big macro assessment, the market's going risk off, so I want to sell everything, or you can just let the chart tell you when the trend is no longer working. And when I'm looking at Amazon, when I'm looking at Alphabet, when I'm looking at some of these leading growth names, I'm seeing strong trends that are continuing. They're persisting, right? And, and as long as that happens, I should not be afraid to keep holding it. Selling early is really rough. As you probably know, you can think of an example of when you've done that. Uh, it's not a lot of fun. And selling something after a 20% gain and leaving a 200% gain on the table, there's nothing worse. So why not follow the trends? Trend following means continue to follow the trends as they go higher. For now, a chart like Amazon, not broken, so stay with it, I would argue. Chart number two, the move index. I mentioned looking at volatility. We talk often about the VIX. The move uh, you know, came into a lot of people's radar back here in March because it made a new high. And that was a significant uh, you know, a change in, uh, in the data set, which you have to remember is the VIX basically looks at options data 
uh, and implies volatility for the S&P 500 as the underlying. The move index kind of does the same thing, little different, but kind of does the same thing for the bond market. So kind of like a VIX for bonds. Both of these data sets spiked during the six-week pullback from February to March for the S&P and the NASDAQ. Both of these volatility sets went higher. Look at where the move and the VIX index are today versus where they were in that last major correction. These are two very different environments. That's why I've seen people compare now to February and March. I have to look at a chart like this and say, no, the conditions are actually quite different between these two. And you're not seeing the elevated uncertainty or the fear, if we call the VIX the fear gauge that we have in previous cycles. I think this chart is an important one to watch to see if and when we get that move higher in, uh, in these two indexes. I don't think it's an if, I think it's a when. And watch that as a sign of a risk-off move in both asset classes. Finally, the energy sector. I implied some of the energy stocks pulling back a little bit. Look at the chart of MRO, uh, any of the other leading energy stocks. You probably see a pattern kind of like this today. This is the dreaded bearish engulfing pattern, a two-bar candle pattern, an up day and a down day. Days two range engulfs, days one uh, open to close range. That is a bearish short-term sign. May tell us that big rally in energy, taking a bit of a breather uh, here in the next couple days. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Uh, thanks again for all the great mailbag questions. Please keep them coming. We could use a couple more questions. We'd love to answer you in our Friday show. For Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.